Hey guys, yours truly Kevin Grace. I am at King Memorial Park Cemetery here in uh, Windsor Mill, Maryland. It's a little bit outside of Baltimore. Came to pay my respects to a man that was a, uh, I guess you want to call him a drug kingpin. His name, Melvin Douglas Williams, AKA Little Melvin. I actually met him two different times, probably about 2009 and 2010. And, um, 2010 actually he came to my father's funeral and I had no idea that they knew each other and he said that they knew each other from drill uh, Park um, swim pool uh, Back in the day, so I was real surprised to see him But anyway, he wound up passing away uh, December 3rd 2015 from cancer, but anyway little Melvin was born in Baltimore December of 1941 and in the 70s and 80s he was uh, trafficking heroin and in a documentary on FX he called uh, tapping the wire he admits that he probably made uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, trafficking heroin now 1984 he was arrested for cocaine trafficking in 1985 he was sentenced to 34 years in um, Lewisburg Penitentiary and he wound up being paroled in uh, 1996 uh, when he came out uh, a few years later he got in more legal trouble in 1999 March of 1999 he wound up pistol pistol whipping uh, a man that uh, owed him $500 and then he was posed since he was on parole he was uh, sentenced to 20 years and it wound up being a mistrial he only wound up serving about three years and he wound up uh getting out in 2003 now he wound up doing some acting on uh, the wire he played uh, a deacon and uh ironically david simon had written different stories about him and he asked him to do that little acting role uh also on uh BET there was a show called American Gangster and they featured little Melvin and he I guess talked about his life uh, of crime but anyway he's buried right here I'm gonna show you this beautiful headstone it's a picture of he and his wife his wife Mary isn't passed yet but uh, this is a picture of Melvin there and uh, it says right here forever in our hearts gone but not forgotten so he's buried here in section section 15 not far from the roadside right right there if you do come um right from the original mausoleum so not not too far um he did help there's some pictures of him back in the 60s right after the king riot they asked him to calm down the uh community so they have him uh talking to the community trying to calm down and keep the peace i'll try to show you that picture and uh vid any video of it as as well but uh you never know who you meet in life but uh, anyway this is little melvin melvin williams if you like this video please subscribe down below and feel free to leave any comments respect I'm Melvin Williams. I've spent 30 years in federal penitentiaries all over America. No day that I was confined did I not study law. The events, some events of my life brought about an HBO series called The Wire, of which I played the deacon. Purpose for this documentary, this video, is to educate young African Americans of their need to study law. If you were stopped in a motor vehicle, the first determination you would have to make is if you had violated some 
rule or procedure for driving. Second, if there is some violation of your vehicle, light out, light broke, improper turn. After determining that none of those are in effect, then you simply wait for the officer to approach your vehicle and you have your hands clearly where he can see them, either on the stern wheel or out of the window. And then you listen very carefully to what he has to say and comply. License, registration. Usually he will tell you what is the basis for his stopping and asking you for your license and, and registration. In the event that he does not, then at that time you ask him and see what the determination brings. If he that after asks you to search your vehicle, the answer is always no. The mere fact that he asks lets you know that he doesn't have the authority to do so. And there's certainly no reason for you to give him authority that the, the Constitution hasn't given him. With that, you continue to wait and see what and where the next question or line of questions go. What happens if the police ask you to uh, get out of your vehicle and uh, to sit on the ground as they proceed with their um, process? Well, the controlling case for a police officer's judgment of what goes on in your vehicle is contingent to Terry versus Ohio. And the consequence to the police officer is always that there are things that are within your reach while you're sitting in your vehicle that can cause him discomfort. So for that reason, he might want you out of your vehicle that way you can't reach into the glove compartment where there might be something to cause him harm. Having you set on the ground, having shown no reason why you have done anything to sit on the ground does not reach the level of police authority. Okay, so they can't make you sit on the ground. He should not make you sit on. He can make you. He's the only guy in town with a gun. So if he tells you to get on the ground, certainly you should get on the ground. I would want to know immediately with my lawyer present the next day, the next week, why I was demanded to get on the ground. I would want to know. But what should you do if and when uh, they search you and they do find something they consider to be illegal. Why do you need to determine why you were searched? You were gotten out of your car and searched. And for what reason? What probable cause had you given him to ask you to withstand a search or just to search you? That's a violation of the Fourth Amendment unless he defines exactly what and why he has elected you and why he has chosen to search you. So when you go to court, what should be a person's defense if a police stop the vehicle, ask them to get out, search the person and the vehicle, and they found something and there was no consent? What should be your defense in court? There's two parts to that. You, your contention is that you, he, you were stopped and he found something in your vehicle that was considered to be illegal. I don't know if it was a controlled substance or if it was a weapon. But the bottom line is you've made it clear that he found something that should not have been or he should not have found in your vehicle. Now we have to determine what was the basis or where did the Supreme Court give him the authority to search your vehicle? And if so, then you have to honor it because I mean it's the law of the land. But in the event that he has acted on his own and that's what a police officer does when he is outside of the scope of the law, he violates the law himself. And can 
have police pull you over, smell marijuana, and use that as probable cause. There is no Supreme Court case that I have read in 40 years that gives the police officer the authority of using his nose to determine a controlled substance, especially now that marijuana and certain amounts of it surely are determined to be acceptable, not legal, but acceptable. What if a police stops you, not in a vehicle, but you in transit, uh, walking, bike riding or whatever, and they want to detain you for questioning or search your person, what should you do? Comply. First and foremost, comply to keep from getting beat up. And try as best as you can to see a badge number or a patrol car number or something that would further allow you to identify this person at another occasion. And when there is not as much danger of you getting hit in the mouth for being uh, too responsive. I have written this book fruit of a forbidden tree for the purpose of educating you who look like me as to the significant need of law understanding. Had I known a fraction at the outset of my incarceration of what's in this book, not only would I not have served 30 years of institutional confinement in federal penitentiaries, I wouldn't have served 30 days. This is, this is a book that you're going to see everywhere in a minute. It's it's about a young kid that was 14 and he was placed in a world where they bet big sums of money and ultimately throughout the rest of my young life I learned to play pool, crap, and cards and amassed a reputation for being one of the, one of the wise guys. And at some point in my life it offended some people. I thought it offended white folks at first. It offended black people. Some black people that were under that Willie Lynch syndrome. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I was, I've always been this complexion, meaning I've always been dark. There was a group of people in Baltimore when I was younger, very light complected, very straight haired, and they controlled the numbers. The numbers came most of the monies that came to the community that came through the numbers wasn't seen through the same eyes as drug money. The numbers man was seen almost like a hero. And ultimately, I think there came a time when I was called to assist in stopping a riot. And upon being successful in doing that, those persons that were you might say, in control of things, were offended by what they thought was my ability to convince other people. And so they started the rumor that any, and I won't say the word, but they used the N-word, that could stop a riot, could start one. We need to put him in the penitentiary. And so without my knowing it, that's what was the predicate of not going to the penitentiary. They set out to send me to the penitentiary. Ultimately, with all of this genius IQ that I had for numbers and gambling, I didn't know law. I had no knowledge at all of the law. I was completely ignorant to the law. And God thought I was God. You know, got to the point where you got so much money from doing different things and you got so many people two and three times your age taking orders from you does something to your head. And so those powers that be and some of their cronies being police 
on a day that I can remember, put 16 pills of narcotics in my body. And my ignorance of the law allowed them to manipulate me throughout the judicial system until I ultimately went to the penitentiary. Upon going to the penitentiary, knowing that I was ignorant of the law, I began to study law. Every day that passed from that point on, I studied and learned something about the law. It's been 40 years now. I could pass the bar in every language that I speak, which is French, Spanish, and English now. I am knowledgeable en enough now at law that I can teach constitutional and criminal law. I've done everything that I can to make all of the unusual events of my life illuminate. I made them stand out so that you will see what it's like to, to be the godson of the Jewish boss of bosses, how unusual that was. How to be accepted in places where most folks that look like me couldn't get in. How to be able to spend your name where most folks can't spend money. It's, it's been an enjoyable ride for the most part. But the 26 and a half years in penitentiaries all around the planet, that offsets it. I got second mixed emotions about that. But again, it is what it is. You, you, one part goes with the rest. And it's a good feeling also to get to a penitentiary a thousand, two thousand, three thousand miles away from home and have some people in other nationalities meet you and kiss you on the cheek or on your neck and hug you like they've missed you that your credibility stands before you. you it's like, hey, you're home. Now, we, we wanted to meet you in another circumstance, but this is where you sleep. These are your family. If you need some money, he keeps the money. If you want to eat, that's where you sit at to eat. It's a good feeling. I see young people to be eager to be guided. They're smarter and bigger than ever before in history. And it seems that they have so few people that they respect that ultimately they follow someone who should be following someone else. So you might say that's the blind leading the blind. Naturally, anytime a blind man is in charge and you're following him, it's only two things can happen. One is bad and the other is worse. I think the cycle inevitably can't be broken as long as narcotics is the main thoroughfare and the main substance and the main source of economy to the young black kid in the inner city communities. It's no way that you're going to tell a young black kid, get a GED and then get a college degree and then we're going to pay you some money while he's getting somewhere between $500 and $1,000 a day right now selling narcotics. There's no trade-off, unfortunately. If you can recall one thing about the picture of Godfather, they stated clearly, let's put it in the darkest neighborhood. It's been being done like that for forever. And if you want to believe that little kid around the corner that's controlling two eight balls or whatever else he's got is responsible for all the narcotics that exist all over the United States every day, every week. I got some beachfront property in Arizona, I study. Your environment doesn't stop you. Your environment makes it difficult. What you have to see is that through me and all of the others around the planet that look like me, you're gonna have some good days. You're gonna have some days that you got so much money, it's sinful. You're gonna have some automobiles that are so long and got so many gadgets in it, you can't figure out how to use all of them. But at the end of the day, 12 people, usually all white, from juries picked all around the planet, like in Baltimore, when you go to federal court, they pick your jury from hell, thought, Bethesda. People where the last time they saw somebody black, he worked in McDonald's. 
he didn't own a Maybach Benz or a house up on the top of the hill overlooking everybody. So they got styles that they used to seeing you in. Again, it's difficult, but along with all of your student study, open a case law called Find Law. You can find that on your computer and study something about the law every day. Again, the law is the thing that governs and keeps everything in order. If you're ignorant of it, they're going to tell you ignorant thereof is no excuse. The same book that the prosecutor reads, it's open to you. Because I had been so conscientiously studying law, I knew that it was just a matter of time, but then time is nobody's friend. So ultimately it took 12 flat out of me to get out of the narcotic sentence that I had. And then immediately after that, I was given another 22 year sentence for being in possession of a weapon that I never touched. But that's the system that's, that's profiled you. you know, they're angry at you. And they're angry today. So I'd like to say also to all of you young guys that see me in the wire and see me on American Gangster that are impressed with what it's like to be an American Gangster. Make no mistake about it, in all of this wealth and automobiles that I'm presumed to have had, there's no trade-off for 26 and a half years in the federal penitentiary. I don't care what kind of money you got, how much it's weighed, and the kind of feelings that are generated around a world where everything happens too late and too far in the future for all of the people there constantly keeps an atmosphere that's so thick you can cut it. In my 26 and a half years and in being in the street, I've witnessed 200 murders, at least. My honest feeling of law enforcement is that if you're not ignorant of the law, you'll realize that the best thing that you can do at law is keep your mouth shut. Everything you say can and will be used against you. Why say anything? That's Miranda. Whether they give you Miranda or not, the most significant thing you could do upon being arrested, shut up. You never win a case that you testify against yourself. The second thing that is of importance is that there's only one thing worse than an American gangster in America, and that's a terrorist. And they want you both dead. So you young people out there in America are impressed with what I'm supposed to be and that your joy and your epitome is to become uh, an American gangster, it ain't fun, baby.